Um, so for those of you that haven't come across the JNCC before, uh, we are the public body that advises the UK government and devolved administrations on UK-wide and international nature conservation. Uh, we are an impartial scientific authority um, and we provide advice on practical, policy-relevant, evidence-based solutions to support decision-making. So this work that you're hearing about today is supported and partly funded by our wider Copernicus Uzeruptic project. Um, just in case you need an introduction, but I'm hoping that you don't, but uh, the Copernicus programme is of course the most ambitious Earth observation programme to date and Copernicus delivers operational data by observing our environment, primarily using a suite of satellites called the Sentinels. It collects, stores and analyzes data and provides products and services. And the data is openly and freely available in a wide range of applications here. So today we'll be hearing a lot about Sentinel 5P, which um, is part of the atmospheric monitoring suite of satellites. Um, the, the, the Funding source specifically for our project is the Caroline Herschel Framework Partnership Agreement. Um, it is a consortium of organisations of which JNCC are one of these uh, and it aims to increase the uptake and use and services. Um, and it does this by implementing a series of actions. So JNCC's action is structured like this. JNCC's statutory and UK and strong culture of partnership, working and innovation means we are uniquely placed to develop shared cost effective solutions for our partners and stakeholders. So our action has a series of components designed to enable long term uptake of Copernicus data across UK public environmental functions. Uh, some of today's work um, is carried out as part of our support for applications uh, work package. Uh, to give you a little bit of a flavour of some of our other work under the wider project, uh, this includes running uh, the implementation group, which is a monthly teleconference where a wide group of people get together to share ideas, discuss methods uh, and help each other sol solve any problems when it comes to Earth observation. So a little bit wider than Copernicus, Copernicus specifically, um, but we are also have a series of thematic workshops. Uh, we ran one on soil moisture back in July and we've got a water quality one coming up in October. Uh, and we're also running a series of training sessions on radar later on in the year as well. Um, if you would like any more information on the wider project or any of the events I just mentioned, then please visit the JNCC website right here or you can also visit the Caroline Herschel website uh, itself or you can get in touch with Lynn Healy the program manager or myself uh, my email was on the first slides which uh, will be shared with everyone um, so that's it from me and uh, I hope you're looking forward to the rest of the workshop today like I am thank you so uh, today what I'm talking about is um was based on a, a, a small workshop we did within the Environment Agency at the beginning of Andrew's project. Um, I've made it slightly more generic, so it does apply to some of the other products that Klaus was talking about, but there are, in this talk, very sort of methane-specific things as well. Okay. okay, so the first thing we really wanted to sort of introduce is what I sort of term this tropomi ecosystem. Um, and what I mean by this, this is everything that surrounds the whole sort of program in this, this sense. So Klaus has given us a very nice overview or introduction to the, the, the mission and projects that are ongoing. Um, and what this sort of slide really sort of endeavours to show is if you look at the graphic on the right hand side, this is the system, this is the, Earth, sort of the part of the Earth system that Tropomi is really trying to help capture processes within and sort of sort of feedback information that we can use to sort of to learn more about the you know ongoing climate pollution etc um and these sort of other two images these are sort of these are what we've we're quite used to now we see quite a lot of these in the news um so it's uh it should, it's, it's quite a familiar sort of uh, thing now for most people um he did a, he did uh, sort of allude to this a bit so tropomi is um you know the strong point of tropomi is it measures across all these uh, different bands in the electromagnetic spectrum and this allows us to have a whole bunch of products 
and for people who are sort of curious about all these products and other other things around the mission the the first sort of port of call is this landing page which is the link is on the bottom and highlighted in pink you can see these little buttons here which will take you through to the actual web pages of the specific specific products itself and as the class was saying what's really nice is that this is supported quite long term so the current mission running up to 2024 but he said because of the onboard fuel we could look to see this you know go much beyond this lifetime so it's it's really set up for this long term uh, sort of view so if you go to this um, this data portal and you, you click through to your product of choice the first thing you sort of you come to is this sort of data products page and if you look along the, the right hand side of this slide you can see some of the some of the, sort of the boxes that you'll see so at the top you'll see links to different types of data and documentation this level one level two auxiliary validation data access and mission performance information um, these sort of, some of these tabs are expandable so you sort of can navigate through to what you want um, underneath the documentation you will always see these three um, acronyms here so starting from the top the atpd which is the algorithm theoretical basis document this is a very technical document which has all the detail of the algorithm used to produce the variable you're interested in um, next from that is what we would call the product user manual and this is more geared at um, you know how you go about using the data rather than the theory behind it and finally what's called the product readme file um, is a very condensed version of the PUM and some details from the APD at times and as a new user the way you would approach these is you'd start from the bottom and work your way backwards um, so the readme does really give you a very sort of quick start into to how to use the product of your choice um, and as Cloud said before so the sort of data that you can currently get to what's known as level one and level two so level one data are the the radiances or the reflectance that we sort of the satellite captures at the top of the atmosphere and this is what scientific teams around the world we use to produce their own um, data products um, as, long, as well as ESA and sort of other space agencies and when these products turn from these radiances into something more geophysical such as NO2 we would then call this level two um, so the the thing about level one and level two products these are always on what was called the swath resolution so this is as measured by the satellite as it orbits the earth um, they tend to be bigger files and they yeah they have they will they sort of map one between the two another point is um you know, that some of these level two products also use as input into others so things like cloud for instance are used to screen um, the level one data that then goes to a, another level two product in that sense um there were questions earlier in the last session about the, some of the average gridded data so these would be known as level 3u and level 3 data um, which don't currently exist on these portals but this is where you either map the product onto a regular grid uh, by orbit or what we call a granule which is a snapshot of time which can range between sort of five to 90 minutes um, and then level three which is then when you average it over a much longer time period so this is daily monthly or even yearly uh, in this case um, and some of these products also are normally driven by user needs uh, as well um, so once you've found the product you want, um, there are three different streams that you can use. So this is something else Klaus spoke about. So this near real time stream where it's available within three hours. This is really data that's for operational applications. Um, people use this quite commonly in things like now casting as well. Um, however, it's potentially incomplete and not without the full data quality. So for longer term studies this is not something you necessarily would use but for things like if you want to look at um, uh, events especially like fires the volcanic eruptions you may want this nrt data in that sense then the offline stream which is the the mainstream of data that's available um, so this is yeah available within normally a few days after the overpass it's suitable for most users um, and it has you say like it has things like corrections for bias correction in as well. Um, there is another variant of this called reprocessing, and this is intended for more long-term analysis, um, and it has the latest version, 
run over the whole archive in order to ensure uniformity of the data processing. Um, and this is important when we think about things like trends. So uh, with only a few years of data at the moment, it's not necessarily an issue, but when we start to think about the length of time Trop Homing will be operating over possibly 10 years or more, uh, mixing of these data streams should be avoided if, it, if you want to look at these long-term effects. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is third party sort of, or sort of research products also exist inside this sort of ecosystem. So it's not just data from available, there's other groups within Europe and sort of the US and other places um, producing data all the time. So, so examples of this would be methane data from the University of Bremen um, and also solar induced fluorescence from JPL are all freely available as well. The caveat here is they all have their own independent learning curve and they're not necessarily maintained or released or supported in the same way. So um, becoming an expert in methane data for the operational product doesn't necessarily uh, mean you can just switch straight, say, to the Bremen product uh, and it be exactly the same. So within the project um, that Andrew has been running, we identified three main sources of data for methane um, level two products. So the first one on the left here is from ESA, uh, which I've just been discussing. So the data is, with the data available after a few days, um, it's good for things like COVID-19 related studies in this sense. So, and that's applicable to all, all variables in that sense. Um, the other two sort of products we found are research ones. So this, the middle one from SRON, this can be sort of thought as the precursor to the operational product because the algorithm for the operational product comes from SRON. Um, unlike the ESA data, it's, it's stored in one dimensional, data names are slightly different, and it's, it runs over a fixed time, so it even runs up to the end of March 2020, in a sense. And similarly, the one from Bremen that I previously mentioned, um, again is 1D and actually only runs to the end of 2019. So um, both, all three have their own weaknesses and strengths, um, in that sense. And I'd say all three again are freely available. So the uh, Sentinel-5 um, hub is um, something Klaus briefly spoke about. This is the, sort of the, the main places you can get the ESA data from. Uh, all the user guides and things there uh, sort of connected to this data as well. <clears throat> and comparable to the other two products, these are available from FTP sites maintained by the institutions themselves. Um, neither of them have uh, user guides in the same way. Um, so the Estron product really only has a paper, um, which is currently in discussions, which describes it, but it's going to be very similar to the ESA product. So some of the ATPD and PUM uh, documents would be applicable there. Um, whereas the Bremen product has a very brief uh, product user guide and then a paper describing the algorithm in that sense. And what's quite important here is all three products are available in NetCDF4 format, which is a sort of a harmonized um, sort of approach across all ESA uh, missions and products in that sense. So for those not familiar with NetCDF, um, I'll just describe quickly here. So Network Common Data Form, it's been around for about 30 years now. It's used extensively in sort of EO and sort of client applications. And it's an array orientated scientific data format, essentially. So <clears throat> it stores arrays from one to five dimensions, usually. Um, and this is what the graphic on the right sort of demonstrates. So you could have your geospatial data sort of in the, the longitude latitude coordinates, and then as a function of time. But then it can also include other uh, dimensions to deal with things like model or altitude levels, ensemble members, or spectral uh, dimensional points. Um, the, the software libraries are freely available, uh, which makes it sort of machine independent in this case, and its functionality can be incorporated into sort of third party software environments such as ArcGIS, uh, which Ty will sort of be talking about a bit later. Um, and its sort of current version is, is, is NetCDF4, so this is where you'll see that sort of terminology used in places. Um, there are many things you can use to view it. This is a um, a nice free tool that NASA produces called Panoply, um, which you can get from the link above there. It's sort of, it's a, it, it's a Java sort of program that runs freely on the top of your desktop. And you can basically use it to browse the inside of the files. So the graphic on the left shows um, a couple of S5P files being loaded in, and you can sort of see, you can sort of navigate through it and 
you get information on the different fields, you can do some simple plotting um, and do stuff about the metadata. Um, and here's just an example of that. So before when I spoke about the ESA product being at the SWOT level, this is the difference between that and single point. So when you use a tool like Panoply, when you have SWOT data, you can put it on a map very easily and quickly for a quick view. Whereas the single data point, you just get a, a time series in a sense, which is a function of sounding number. So it's, um, it's just different things to bear in mind uh, when you also sort of use these products and how sort of quickly and easily you can do things. So there's a little bit more here now about the um, S5P pre-operations data hub. Okay, so for people who are not familiar, um, so this is free to use. It's just a web, it operates in the web browser. Um, it has the same username and password. Um, so it's, it, you, you don't have to worry about um, creating an account in that sense. And you can download um, single orbits and multiple files of a point and click system. There's also the ability to um, view sort of orbital polygons to see where the overpasses is. So if you're only interested in overpasses over a specific site, you can, you can browse through and find examples uh, which you know cover your target area in that sense. Um, if you're interested in, in lots of data, there's also an API for bulk downloading. So um, you, if you had to download more than a few files through the, the web portal, you would probably get some sort of RSI thing in your finger in a sense. So it's 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 very flexible in the way you can use it. Another way uh, you can get access to the data here in the UK is through a place called the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, CEDA which has a large archive with uh, public and non-public data sets available. Uh, and one of those is the Sentinel 5P archive, um, which you can see here. So it has level one and level two data sets. And um, like I said, so this data is freely available. Um, you, can, you can download single files if you want. Um, the sort of the idea normally is not to, to do that, it's to actually do your work there. Um, what's quite important here is if you see the 705 data has different versioning. So, at, um, the, so in 2019, we see this step from version 1.2 to version 1.3, where we have changes in the algorithm. Um, and being aware of these uh, changes is important, especially when you come to look at time series, because they could account for, for spikes or step functions in the time series you're interested in. So and that's just another caveat to sort of always be aware of. The next thing to sort of briefly look at, so this is again, generic to all uh, products from ESA, is the way the file names are formatted because they too contain a lot of information. Um, so the table breaks it down. So you have things about the mode, the product, the time it was made, the orbit number, um, and when it's produced. And you can find the corresponding uh, level two products by swapping out the product name for other things if you want to combine them, which is always useful. Um, just quickly, third party ones, they tend to come from FTP sites that look a bit like this. So again, this is more of a, you can sort of click one individually, but you have to have the ability to, to do bulk downloads when required. Um, additional data from Copernicus is also quite freely available and easily combinable as well. So. Um, just a note there that you, these are large as well, but the APIs are very similar. So it's, if you something you want to combine, it's very easy to do. Um, and then coverage from Tropomi. So we've seen a few sort of things from Knox, which is from the UV uh, at Park. So in the Sphere, we, we don't have quite the same coverage. We're very affected by cloud and aerosol. Um, we only get measurements over the ocean where we have areas of sun glint, which is because there's a very seasonal pattern that we can see between December and June. Um, and you also get different uh, uh, spatial coverage over the globe depending on the season as well. So there's, it's, a, it's a very different product in, in, in that sense to do things like NO2. Um, so just when it comes to designing your sort of workflow around these things, um, the, the whole thing is very dependent on the infrastructure you have and what you want to do. And the, the best way to approach this is really to build up a simple test of you know how much how much resources it takes to one day and how does it scale um some of the tests that we've done at the university of leicester on our hpc we have seen you know the requirement for quite large memory usage 
um, which can be negated sort of by by design if you if you need to. Um, and that just sort of comes back to this um, around Cedar. It has this HPC system called Jasmine. And here the concept is you take your code to the data. So rather than downloading all that data locally, you can just run your code on top of it in that sense. Um, data quality and uh, data handling quality filtering. Um, so lots of these, again, these things point towards how you really want to use the data, how you want to aggregate it, how are you going to average it? And there's lots of ways to do this. Um, I would say, for, especially for, for, for people like um, you know who deal with stakeholders or decision makers, the a lot of this also comes down to how do you know your your end user really interpret uh, these sorts of information. So it's it, again, this this all sort of builds into your design of your workflow in those senses. And coming up with the averaging can become quite complicated. Um, and it, so there's there's a range of techniques to do that, which I think Ty will speak about later. Um, within the products, you really have a singular quality filter, um, which makes it very easy to use, which you can just uh, turn up and down depending how you want to. Uh, the table on the right here comes from the product readme file, um, sort of outlines what these numbers are based on. There are other variables you can use as a more ex experienced user, such as degrees of freedom and things like this. Um, however, in the first instance, we, you know, we also found that this QA value does to you know remove the bulk of the of the bad data that you want to get rid of but some low values will get through so it's not a uh you know a one-stop shop uh, finally um for the bold and the brave we come to think the uncertainties um so class did talk a bit about this and the biases so you do get these measurement um uncertainties per pixel but these are not the full description of the full uncertainty in the system or your, your full error budget um, so ESA is moving towards this more standardization of metrological approaches um, within the algorithm the products. And these, these come at different levels. So in sea surface temperature and land surface temperature, these are very, very advanced. Uh, new missions on um, sea surface level, having them designed at the, the level of mission concept, um, as well as things like truth, which is being left in the UK. Um, so the you will see a variety of ways these things are dealt with throughout different products as well. Um, but as a user, the things you're looking at is you know how these going to be best dealt with with what you want to do, and how again are you going to present these to your end user? Um, this topic is extremely non-trivial. Um, however, there are a couple of frameworks which uh, where resources are freely available uh, for people to use and adopt. Uh, the, the first one is towards unified error reporting called Turner, which is led by uh, uh, Thomas von Klarman from Germany. And this really comes from the, the level two product onwards sort of um, thinking. And the other project is a Horizon 2020 project, which finished last year called Fiducio, which is led by colleagues at Reading and NPL. Um, and this deals with the, the fundamental measurement made at the sensor level all the way through to sort of level three products. Um, and they say so they both have a, a raft of resources for people to to use and refer to um but yeah it's it's definitely something for uh again more experienced users in that sense and that's it thank you for listening the next speaker <laughs> who is uh ty hayward from the environment agency and he's going to be uh taking us through uh, a user's perspective of developing a capability to process troponi air quality and greenhouse gas products. Um, my name is Ty and I work for the Environment Agency as a uh, geomatics analyst within the geomatics team. Um, my presentation follows on from Tim's and is titled Development of a Capability to Process Tropomi Air Quality and greenhouse gas products, a new user's experience and lessons learned. Um, on to the next slide for me, please. So the background slide. Um, I have a background in JS, optical and radar remote sensing. However, this is not my first experience with Earth observation air quality data set. Um, I've previously worked with uh, Andrew Brown on the case study where we analyzed ammonia measurements across the UK from the IRD instrument aboard the METOPS satellite 
and uh, now I've worked on this study to use a tropomy to investigate methane emissions from the landfills across the UK. Um, this presentation will provide insight into the methodological approaches, experiences and lessons I have learned as a new user of Sentinel-5P tropomy data. Um, on to the next slide for me, please. Um, so downloading uh, Sentinel-5P tropomy data. Um, we decided to go with the official ESA methane tropomy level two data set for the following reasons. Um, as Tim has already outlined some of the overviews of the products. Um, so these reasons are, the product archive is current. So um, by that new data sets are added um, every few days after acquisition. Um, that is the offline products which we were mainly using. And um, secondly, the official products will be supported with future updates by the ESA. Um, as the other products which have been discussed are third party, this is not always a guarantee. Um, these reasons are important for the EA, as in if we were to use uh, Tripomi data in the future for air quality monitoring, um, especially where the data uh, may be potentially needed in a timely manner, um, having access to this uh, current and present archive is uh, a, a, an advantage over the other data products. Um, so to download the data, we use the Python library Sentinel SAT uh, to download the data in bulk. This uh, library provides the capability to download all Sentinel products directly through the ESA's open access API. In total, we downloaded 3,093 level two methane products from 4th of May 2018 to the 30th of June 2020. With these products, a section of the swath all um, falls within the input search AOI. Um, the data, as Tim said, is provided in the NetCDF4 format and for this, um, which is almost the entire archive of uh, methane products over the UK and Ireland. The data volume was only 164 gigabytes. Uh, this is great as the data can be stored on a local drive easily, but um, we have to be aware that as the um, archive increases, so does this data requirement. On to the next slide for me, please. So again, this is just the AOI. It includes all of the UK and Ireland. Unfortunately, a small section of France is also included in the bounding box. Uh, more on this on a later slide. Um, next slide for me, please. Um, so processing Tripomi level two products into level three products in ArcGIS. Uh, some of the challenges and lessons which I learned um, so just a quick reminder from Tim's presentation, the difference between level two and level three products. So level two products are geophysical variables at the swath resolution, whereas level three products, or sometimes referred to as level three U in a singular form, can be considered as the geophysical variables mapped onto a regular grid. Um, so I first attempted to use Esri's ArcGIS Pro to process this data, as it is the Environment Agency's corporate GIS solution. Uh, we've, we use Esri software across the agency, and such as the final output products of this work need to be compatible with Esri software, otherwise the benefit of new, using these new data sets, such as Tropomi, is, very limit, is limited to a very small number of people within the agency. Um, so I was initially quite hopeful as ArcGIS reads IRZ ammonia files into its tools without any problems. Um, ArcGIS has also recently developed their capability with NetCDF fairly significantly. Um, unfortunately, due to the structure of the uh, level two Tripomi NetCDF files, they could not be read into any of the multi-dimensional multi 
secure processing tools. Um, one of the main ones, such as may crash the layer from the NetCDF file uh, for further gridding in GIS. Um, during this case study, I have uh, raised this issue with Esri's technical support. Um, the issue is currently ongoing, and Esri have designated this as a bug within the software to be potentially addressed in a future update. Um, on to the next slide for me, please. So, processing level two to level three data products outside of J uh, ArcGIS. So, there's very little publicly available information on how to process Troponi level two to level three data products. And within many academic papers, few authors go into the specific details on the methods which they have used to process to level three data. Um, through searching ESA resources, I discovered an archived RUS, which is the Research and User Support Group uh, webinar for processing Tropomi Level 2 data using the HARP Python library. Um, RUS is an ESA slash EU funded open service to promote the uptake of Copernicus data and support the scaling of research and development activities with Copernicus data. This is achieved in part through training courses and webinars, many of which have been recorded and put on YouTube for um, users to view. Um, on to the next slide for me, please. <clears throat> so with this um, HARP library, which I uh, found via RUS, um, the HARP library is a data harmonization toolkit for Earth observation data. Um, it supports Sentinel 5P Tropomi, along with several other satellite sensors, uh, details of which can be found in the library documents on the GitHub link provided. Um, there is also an active user support forum for the library, uh, of which I've used and found very helpful. Um, again, there's a link there. Um, and it's a great. Um, forum if uh, you are using some of the products and you'd like some advice. Um, so regarding HARP, the main input uh, variables are the input product. For example, with methane, if it is the regular product or the bias corrected product, um, the grid size which you would wish to use for processing and what quality assurance are you would like to process to. I process two bias corrected data sets, one with a QA value of 0.3 and one with a QA value of 0.5. Although the QA value of 0.3 is below the ESA's official data filtering guidance of 0.5, we found that when the value is increased over this, all pixels near the coastline are filtered out, which unfortunately is where several of the UK's largest methane landfill emitters are located such as we decided to take two data sets forwards. A grid size of 0 0.01 by 0 0.01 degrees was used in both data sets. Uh, this equates to approximately one kilometers by one kilometers in specific places. Um, this grid cell size was used to prevent data loss due to the um, direction of the orbit of Sentinel-5. Um, onto the next slide for me, please. So HARP considerations and lessons learned. The HARP toolset is still currently under development and such as does not have the capability to perform the uncertainty propagation of the level three products. Um, Tim discussed some of these earlier. Um, however, I have been told by the developer that this is in the pipeline who stated uncertainty propagation is something which we want to introduce in the HARP toolset at some point, but this is not an easy topic um, and here's the link for this. Um, despite this, the implementation may still be a while off as the issue was first identified on GitHub in 2016. Um, on a positive note, um, processing to level three products using HARP is efficient. Um, the process was significantly faster than when I attempted to read the data into ArcGIS. Um, it's also relatively simple once you're more accustomed to the library. Processing can be performed in a few lines of Python. And um, 
finally, the workflows uh, are mostly transferable across to other geophysical variables, for example, NO2. On to the next slide for me, please. So, level three uh, methane products, uh, quality assurance filtering. So these, this slide summarizes some of my experiences and findings from processing to level three products. Um, at a QA value of 0 0.3, a total of 1,050 valid files, uh, for example, those containing valid pixels over the AOI, um, remains of the 3,093 downloaded level two products. An example of the SWAF file, which would have not been included, but would have been downloaded can be seen in the image. Um, when this value is increased to 0 0.5 on the QA value, only 483 files remained. Um, it should be noted that these files are not all individual days. Um, the UK and Ireland have several orbit overpasses each day. Um, also, not all of these files contain pixels over the UK and Ireland. For example, the northern coast of France is included in the AOI. Um, some files may only contain pixels over this area, but this is very few. Um, the weather also has an impact on the amount of available data within each file. For example, Tropomi is impacted by cloud cover, and such as, depending on conditions, some files may only contain a handful of pixels over mainland UK. Um, this results in a relatively uh, this results in a figuratively small date, set of data for long term averaging, despite using the entire archive of Tropomi methane data over the UK and Ireland. However, as we have seen for applications such as COVID comparisons, um, we may only need 10 to 14 files for these um, uh, comparisons. Um, so on to the next slide for me, please. Um, reading uh, level three data into ArcGIS. So again, uh, once the data had been processed, I attempted to put it into ArcGIS, although this was an issue. Um, multiple different ways have been tried to get this to work as ArcGIS has a really good tool set for multi-dimensional time series analysis. Um, unfortunately, this hasn't worked due to the aforementioned bugs in Arc. Um, so the methane products have instead been converted into a TIFF format so that it can be visualized in GIS. Importantly, these can be read across the EA where further analysis can take place if needed. And from these TIFFs, um, methane concentration maps across the entire study area were produced for the entire time series. On to the next uh, slide for me, please. Um, so the takeaway points from my experiences with um, it's not 5p. Um, we have been surprised at the complexity of the Tropomi methane level 2 product. Uh, this is when it's compared with the IRZ ammonia level 2 product. Um, so a higher spec computer has been used to process the level 2 data at speed appropriate for our, our project. Um, uh, the Tropomi NO2 level 2 products, they're even larger and more complex than the, um, than the uh, methane products. Um, and it's also noted that the NCEO uh, use a high performance computing system for their data processing of the Tropomi data sets. Um, and just to reiterate, there's uh, little publicly available information on how to process Sentinel 5P uh, currently. Um, the current tool set recommended by Copernicus, HARP, which is still in development, and um, ESRI, which provides the EA's corporate GIS solution currently does not have the capability to process the Tropomi level two data and it has issues reading the level three data. Um, and uh, finally, there's a sparse amount of data over the UK and Ireland despite daily coverage. Um, this is largely due to its longitudinal positional on the globe. However, uh, this archive is increasing daily and is expected to go on for several more years. Um, on to the next slide for me, please. Final slide. So, um, as some uh, a few more takeaway points, um, we have developed in-house capability at the EA 
to independently retrieve, process, and analyze Sentinel 5P tropomy methane products. Uh, much of the knowledge here, e.g. the heart processing, is transferable to other geophysical variables, for example, nitrogen dioxide. Um, uh, this case study has positioned the EA in terms of capability to retrieve and process data from future Sentinel-4 and Sentinel-5 instruments. Um, the results produced by this case study have agreed very well with those produced by the MCO as verification stage. Um, more on this later on with Harmut's presentation. And um, finally, the case study has increased the exposure to EO issues in other ways, for example, critiquing the potential use of EO instruments for future air quality and greenhouse gas work. Um, thank you very much. That's my talk done. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. So, so in the next couple of minutes, I want to talk uh, about one of the case studies that we've carried out. Uh, this case study was focused on, on methane and landfills. And um, the work really has been carried out by Ty and Tim and also by Rothio and not really by myself. So it's really, I really need to acknowledge here uh, a lot of people who contributed to that. I should also say that, um, so this was a relatively brief case study. And I think um, you know, there are still lots of things that we would like to to do in addition to what I'm going to show in the, in the following slides. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So the main focus here is, is really tropomi, and we already heard a lot about tropomi from, from Tim and, and, and from Klaus. So I think the key feature that we want to exploit here is the fact that tropomi can give us these global methane data sets uh, with relatively high spatial resolution of seven by 5.5 kilometers square. So, Tropomi is really the very first instrument that gives us essentially this ability to observe methane globally every day. So I think we really need to appreciate this is a, a massive game changer for us in the atmospheric community. Uh, if you compare this to abilities that we have from other satellites like Skiamaki and Gosart, who are much more observing methane on a scale of like hundreds of kilometers. So this is really a new generation of an instrument which provides us with really new capabilities. And the main capability we are interested in is really to see if we can pick out plumes and, and emission sources uh, with, with this, in this Trouble data set. Okay, next slide, please. And Klaus has already shown a couple of very nice examples where indeed it has been shown that this can be done very successfully. And uh, there are now many, many um, studies in the, in the literature and I just wanna pick out two examples here. Uh, one is uh, an oil and gas field, um, which um, has been very nicely observed by Tropomi. And you can see really that although, um, again, there are some holes because of clouds and other reasons, you can really nicely pick out the, the methane enhancements related to the emission plumes. And here, these enhancements are typically on the order of a couple of 10, 10 of, of parts per billion. Um, now, there are some other nice examples also related to landfills. Uh, one nice example is from a landfill in Argentina, which was actually very recently highlighted directly on the ESA webpage. So what is quite important here is that essentially it has been very successfully demonstrated thanks to the, well, relatively high spatial resolution of Tropomi. We can now start to observe these plumes, which we can relate back to these point source emissions. Uh, and this is actually something that works very well. However, so far, um, all of the studies available are really focusing very much on, on very strong emission sources, which are really super emitters. So these are sources that have emissions uh, exceeding 10 tons of, of methane per hour. So these are very, very strong sources, which are some of the strongest emission sources on the world. Okay, but if you go to the next slide, please. But you're really interested here in this case study was to kind of investigate can we use Tropomi also to really help much more with Western European countries uh, and specifically the UK in their goals to achieve net zero emission targets and also in achieving their commitments towards the Paris Agreement. Uh, methane as a very potent greenhouse gas will of course have to play a major role if we want to achieve this, these goals. And as we already heard, uh, landfills contribute significantly to the methane emission budget 
So here I have a number of 28%, which is a little bit lower than the 37% that was just quoted. But I think my number here is only for landfills and not for the whole waste sector as a, as a whole. Now, one, okay, one big reason why this study here is very interesting for the Environment Agency is that the Environment Agency is responsible for regulating landfills um, and also for the reporting of landfill emissions, um, uh, which are typically modeled with landfill gas generation models, as we just heard by the previous speakers. Now, measurements of these emissions are, are very, very sparse. They are done more sporadically on an occasional basis, uh, and there are quite a number of different techniques how this could be done. I would argue none of them is really perfect, and they're all either very expensive or, or tedious, but there's a number of different ground-based and aerial measurement techniques out there, but landfills are typically not routinely monitored. And of course, this is something that we could indeed achieve with satellites. So satellites could give us this very frequent, more routine monitoring of, of, of landfill emissions, which could also provide a, a big cost saving. So this is why I think this is very interesting and, and, and timely topic. Next slide. So the specific goal of this case study here was really to determine to which, uh, if we can use tropomi data to identify methane emissions from a UK landfill. Um, but there was also a secondary goal, and this was really to prepare essentially the environment agency and help the environment agency to start using satellite data in a more general sense, and also to prepare maybe for some future satellite missions. Okay, so. The first thing we did is we tried to identify what are the, the, the primary targets for landfill emission sources in the UK. And what we have here is a list of the, the top emission sources. So this typically ranges in the order of a few hundred kilograms uh, per hour with the strongest emission source being Culvert landfill site, which is given here uh, as an emission source of exceeding a thousand kilograms per hour. <clears throat> but this is still maybe a factor of 10 or more smaller than the, than the typical examples that we find in the, in the literature. And we expect that the methane enhancement that we will see from such a landfill site will be quite small. So if you do a, a rough estimation, then you find that these emissions will be maybe about five parts per billion. So this is quite small. And it's certainly much smaller than the tropomi uh, measurement precision, which is maybe around 15 parts per billion. So it's quite clear that it will only be possible to see such emission signals if you can do averaging of, of multiple overpasses. So this is something that will be required in order to reveal such signals. Okay, so this means that we put ourselves a really demanding goal, uh, an incredibly demanding goal for such a case study. Um, but this is even maybe more difficult because we are in the UK, which is of course characterized by very frequently unsettled weather conditions, which means that um, we will have potentially uh, relatively sparse coverage because of clouds. Okay, but we still thought it's worth doing this case study, also you know, considering that there is a quite a high risk just because of the potential of, of upskilling uh, of, of the environment agency in the use of, of satellite data. And of course, if you can achieve it, I think the benefit could be could be great. Okay, but we need to be very aware that. This is a very demanding goal, and maybe it is a little bit outside of what we can do with Tropomi right now. Um, I also want to mention that the case study that we carried out was, of course, a, a relatively small case study with, with limited resources. And there are quite a lot of things that we still would want to do, but which we couldn't do within the framework of the existing case study. But we will hopefully manage to do some of these things afterwards. OK, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we already heard from Tim that there are actually different uh, tropomi methane products out there. For this case study, we have used the official ESA product, which is available via the S5P pre-operations hub. And you can see in the top slide here, this is just the an average uh, of the of the ESA product over a half a year, and also the the scatter in the in the in the data and the number of data points. And not very surprisingly, we see that the data points at like a north number of data points at north south gradient, with the north being very sparse and the south being uh, quite high. Uh, we can also see the other products. One product is the Estron product, which is a temporary intermediate product that has been generated by Estron, who are also helping to develop the official ESA product. So they have now generated a new product which has uh, a better 
correction of some apparent biases in the ESA product. So we think it's a better product, but we still have, it came too late, unfortunately, for, for the case study, but I will show some of the results also that we obtained with this SRAM product. But we are quite confident that this SRAM product will actually inform new versions of the ESA product in the future. And finally, there's also an independent product by IOP Bremen, which is not something we have used in this study, although I do think this is actually quite a suitable and, and good data product as well. Okay, but overall, I think what I try to highlight here is that the methane ESA product is actually still to some extent in flux and the product is still evolving and improving with further versions. So I think um, conclusions we draw right now are based on the current version, but in using future versions of the same data set, you might actually get different results. Okay, next slide. So I just want to repeat a little bit part of the methodology and actually Ty already uh, elaborated on that. A significant part of the work that was spent as part of the case study was actually in building the tools of handling the data and indeed um, and, and, and to make the data also usable and accessible uh, with the available software at the environment agency. So this really started with the level two data that we obtained from the pre-operational hub. Then using the HARP toolbox, this has been converted in daily level three net CDF files, taking into account the different quality filters. Now, this product had to be converted into TIFF format so that it could be used by the geoprocessing tools ARCGIS, which is used by the Environment Agency. And finally, ARCGIS has been used to analyze the data and to average it. So you can see there was quite a lot of development necessary to even uh, achieve um, visualizations of, of the product. And finally, we were also interested in uh, looking at averaging according to different weather conditions. Now, we didn't really do it in the way we wanted to do it, uh, meaning really rotating the image according to the wind direction, but instead we used uh, typical weather classifications as well. Um, we hope that we can do the wind derotation at a later stage, but within the within the available resources of this case study, we, we, could, we didn't manage to achieve this as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is now um, just the first overview of, a, of the whole data set that we, uh, that essentially Thai has really worked with. So this is uh, all the data that we have used over 26 months period, and it's averaged over all of the UK. And one of the uh, big questions was, what is the right quality flag to use? So essentially the data has a quality flag inside. The official recommendation of the quality flag is to use a quality flag of, of 0 0.5. And then, of course, you do get the best quality data if you do that. And this is shown on the right hand side. And if we do that, what we can see is actually this is shown in the bottom part. So this is the number of data points and the data coverage. What we see is that essentially the data coverage is very sparse. So typically for each of our bins, we find about 20 data points over the 26 months period. So this means that we have about 26 over uh, 20 overpasses in average over 26 months using this cloud flag, uh, this quality flag. So of course, this makes it very, very difficult. Um, and this is why we also have been motivated to also start to see what would happen if we uh, relax this quality parameter a little bit, we relax it to 0.3. And what you see, this actually increases the, the coverage substantially. So now we get them an average number of, of data points over this about two year periods of about 70. So this is much better and allows us to do much more, much more averaging. But of course, this means that also the quality of the data is potentially reduced. Okay. Now there are a few things you can already see here. There are actually some interesting features. We often can observe some, some extended areas where values are very low, much lower than its surrounding, which actually doesn't really make that much sense. You can see this, for example, over, over East Anglia. And we do think that this is related to an imperfect bias correction in this version of the ESA data. And indeed, if we do the same test with SRON data, we see that these very low values actually disappear. So this means that the SRON data has a better bias correction built in. You can also see there is some some effects near coastal areas where the strict quality filter essentially removes all the area near the coastlines. And this is because the, uh, 
the data producers have decided to have a very strict filter on topography here, which is probably overly strict, but essentially it filters out all the data near the coastlines, which is of course a problem because quite a few of the methane emitters are near coastlines. Okay, next slide please. Now if we zoom in into the landfill regions, and here we can see the Calvert landfill site and also the Welbeck and Skeleton, land, Skeleton landfill site. So this now is with the quality flag of 0.3 and it's simply all the data averaged, okay? Now the first thing you see is actually a little bit um, a disappointment. So you cannot identify any clear features that you would identify as a plume related to landfills. Okay, but I would like to highlight that the color scale here is actually very large. So the whole color scale covers about, um, about uh, well, 150 or so parts per billion, whereas we do think that the signals we are, we are after are really only in the range of five parts per billion. So I think um, indeed, you know, any kind of signal on the order of five parts per billion could very well be hidden in there. And indeed you can see there are very large where there are variability on the order of, of, of 10 or 20 parts per billion within this scene. So there are lots of patterns in the scenes, but they are just not really obvious patterns related to, to landfills. Okay, next slide. Of course, one reason could be that different uh, wind directions will uh, lead to averaging out plume-like signals. So this is why we were uh, sorting the uh, they, the different overpasses according to weather conditions. And here we use the lamp weather types to classify synoptic, the synoptic scale metrology. And here you can see this um, 11 different uh, lamp weather types. And what you can see is that the methane map uh, does vary depending on the weather type, which is really something what we would expect because fundamentally the wind direction, of course, changes depending on, on the type. Uh, but in some of course, in most cases, the number of data points that goes in here now is really low. So you need to be very careful drawing conclusions here. Um, but again, also we do see some features. None of the features really reveal any obvious um, plume-like structures. Okay, so this is quite. Uh, so I think again, we are not really seeing what we want to see. Okay, next slide. I just want to say a few words about the quality insurance because one key step was also to build up the tool. So it's important to verify that the tools are uh, producing correct outputs. So we did this by intercomparing the environment agency um, map to maps independently produced by NCO at Leicester. And this is simply what we see as an average over, over two years. Uh, and what we can see is that overall this looks okay. However, if you look closely you can see there are some square like structures which are where we typically have high meaning red values and we think this is simply caused by difference in the level three processing methods used by the two different software so this is actually not very worrying slightly more worrying is that we can see in coastal areas quite large underestimations by by these blue areas and we think this is because over these two year periods we accumulated different subversions of the of these data sets between NCEO and environment agency which is causing this feature and to actually test this can you go to the next slide we also really downloaded again exactly the same versions and compared again and this is now only shown for a week and you can actually see that the inter comparison now looks looks very good so that we can be confident that um, indeed in both cases we are very much doing the same thing so which is good Okay, next slide. I just want to show a few more tests that we have done. And this was done now by the uh, Leicester and CEO team. And here we have actually used the SRON data. So this is now also a new data set. I would like to highlight that um, we also have used a much smaller color scale, which of course makes all these maps look very different. Okay, so we did a series of additional tests, including we checked for different coverage where we required each of the overpasses having either 70% or 90% coverage. So this is actually shown by the top is 70% and the bottom is 90%. We also applied some altitude correction between the left and the right figures, which is actually not so important. And we also investigated if there is an effect if we um, do course or spatial averaging, which is the top row versus the bottom row of, of, of the two blocks. Okay, and what is quite interesting, we can actually see two things. The first thing is that um, 
if we use the Esron product, we actually do get special maps that look substantially different to what we obtain using the ESA product. Now we can observe multiple plume-like features on the order of, 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 of 10 to 20 ppb. Um, however, uh, they are not necessarily related to the landfill side. So I think we can conclude that we do see um, many kind of false plumes within our area of interest, which could very well hide real plumes. Um, but of course, we first need, would need to find the root cause for potentially these false plumes that we can generate within these areas here. And to further investigate this, I want to go to the next slide. We did look at the individual orbits. And these are actually all the individual orbit tracks that have been used for the averaging that I shown before. And what we can actually see here is actually quite interesting. Um, so if you look very closely at these different orbit tracks, you can actually see that a few of these orbit tracks have some um, striping patterns in them. And I did try to highlight some of them with these yellow arrows. I hope you can, you can spot them. So essentially what we can see is that there's a, a cross-track striping pattern. And actually this is a, a feature which is typically very common in these kind of spectrometers and actually has been very well studied in the Tropomi carbon monoxide product, which is retrieved within the same spectral range. So we think that there are some striping artifacts in this methane product. And of course, these striping artifacts is, of, is probably of the same order of magnitude or exceeding in the, the value that you would expect for our methane plumes. So I think the very first thing is we need to correct for these striping artifacts in the, in the methane data uh, before we can really dig into emission plumes on the order of five to 10 parts per billion. Now, luckily a de-striping method has already been developed for carbon monoxide. And this is something that we will now look into the methane product and come back you know, and repeat the, the analysis of these landfill sites. So we do hope that by removing some of these striping artifacts, we can remove some of these false plumes and make a much more informed decision if we can really identify plumes in the proximity of landfill sites or not. Okay, so my last slide is just the conclusion. So um, I think space-based monitoring of methane emission, I think does have great potential uh, to provide really independent evidence that can help regulations and reporting of these emission sources. Unfortunately, our case study that we have carried out did not yield a very clear positive result. So we did not manage to really identify clear methane plumes related to UK landfill sites. And I think there are multiple reasons for that. The first one is that clearly the emission source of UK landfills are small. And actually this is true for any European landfill as well. So, and indeed for almost any uh, emission source in Europe, uh, with a very few exceptions, they all are comparably small to what we've seen in the literature. So I think it's quite important that we kind of figure out of ways of making this also work uh, for European emission sources. Now the Tropomi methane product is maybe, maybe close will disagree, but I think it's uh, less mature than some of the other products. And one reason is that the 2.3 micron channel is actually something that is relatively new so we are still really in a little bit in more of a learning process than some of the other products which have huge heritage. So I think there is still further improvements to be expected in future releases of the Tropomi methane products. And I do think that it will very much change the results. And I think we cannot exclude that we will manage to see emission plumes also from these weak emission sources with future versions of Tropomi. I think there is still still hope. So I would not say that because we haven't managed in this case study that all hope is lost. I think the opposite. Um, but of course, the other goal of the case study was also to help with upskilling and to develop tools and knowledge, which will be beneficial for the environment agency, especially also um, in the light of, of future satellites that are coming up, which are much more developed to really tackle point source emissions. And of course, um, this is specifically GHGSAT, which has now launched uh, their second series of, of satellites, which has much improved performance, which I think will be quite interesting. But of course, also other satellites like Bluefield and uh, Methanesat, which are expected to be launched um, in 2022. Okay, and I think I 
finish here and I thank you for your attention.